Uh, my name is Naji. I'm currently a group leader at uh, Howard Hughes Medical Institute at its engineering research campus. Um, I uh, will move to UC Berkeley um, to the Department of Physics and Molecular Cell Biology this summer. So in my lab, we develop advanced uh, optical imaging methods, uh, mostly optical microscopy, to, uh, uh, to image brain. Even though our method can be applied to other biological or even non-biological systems as well. One big part we do is so-called waveform shaping, which is basically can be uh, um, one of the waveform shaping approach is called adaptive opt optics. So this is an approach that has been used for many years by astronomers when they try to image stars uh, through the uh, atmosphere using a telescope that is based on Earth. So the problem the astronomers face is that when the starlight is passing through the atmosphere, the wavefront of the light is actually distorted by, by atmosphere because the air masses there has different temperature, different humidity. As a result, they have different refractive index. So when the starlight is passing through the atmosphere, its wavefront get distorted so that it cannot form a very sharp image of the star on the telescope. And we actually, everybody is very familiar with this uh, process because there's a song called Twinkle Twinkle Little Star where you actually, you can even human eye as an optical detector can sense the chan changing um, brightness of the star. That's because also atmosphere is rapidly fluctuating. So that's a particular kind of distortion, which we call optical aberration, also changes with time. So basically, when we want to Im image into a mouse brain, for example, or zebrafish brain, or sea organs, pretty much any kind of uh, biological sample that is a little bit more complex than cultured cells on a cover slip, then the wavefront of the excitation or the fluorescence light can also be distorted by the sample just like the starlight got distorted by atmosphere. The method of adaptive optics was first uh, developed in astronomy to cancel out the atmosphere-introduced aberration so that you can have a very sharp image on the telescope. Um, so, but, but those methods actually doesn't translate well if we just copy them directly into optical microscopy. So in my research, I come up with ways to figure out what is this uh, sample, biological sample-introduced aberration or distortion of the wavefront and then correct them so that we will still have an ideal, perfect image quality, even in an aberrating biological sample. So one of the methods that we developed, though, actually, we can still do this so-called derived wavefront sensing, just like people do in astronomy, using a laser-generated guide star. But we have to make that guide star emit in near-infrared range rather than visible range. Because near-infrared near infrared light uh, um, um, uh, are scattered less by the tissue, we, the wavefront can still be mirrored at a high accuracy. But we also develop other methods that uh, does not require this kind of uh, um, the generation of a guide star or direct measurement of the wavefront. So for example, one of the projects we look at is to look at the VU cortex. So cortex is a layer of the brain that is at the very surface of the brain where basically all our conscious thought process happens. Now, lots of things happening in our brain we don't really think about. For example, you breathe. You don't have to think about, I need to breathe now. And, and so, so, but we look at the cortex, and I look at the visual cortex. That's where visual processing happens. So one question we would like to understand is how the visual processing happens. What kind of input cortex receive from the, the, from a, from a structure called visual thalamus? and how the neurons using those input to generate new property, which allow us to detect edges, contrast, and so on. So we look at living mouse brain. So usually it's head fixed so that they cannot move around. And uh, the, their brain will be, the, the, the cells inside the brain will be expressing certain kind of fluorescent molecule whose brightness will tell us whether the cell become active, whether they fire action potential. So then we put an animal there, and oftentimes they're awake and sometimes even behaving. And then we can put a two-photon fluorescence microscope right above its head, which allows us to image into their brain. And in general, in optical microscopy hasn't really been used for human brain in vivo um, because uh, the, the skulls are opaque. And uh, there are work using you know, longer wavelength light, diffusive imaging methods, but uh, they are not really looking at the type of resolution we are looking at, which is uh, below a micron resolution, where we're looking at really the subcellular structure. We have the resolution to resolve subcellular structure of the neurons. So 
in human brain, because of this, uh, you know, we wanted to be non-invasive. So the type of method that we develop actually at this moment is not applicable. But uh, part of the limitation is not the limitation of the method. It's really the limitation of the contrast agent. So what we are looking at in the human brain. If uh, we are not allowed to introduce any extrinsic fluorescent probes, which would be hard to, to pass any kind of FDA approval, not to say it's unlikely. You know, I think gene therapy you know, in the future, this may become a reality. But uh, if we can only use the uh, intrinsic fluorescence labels or uh, just intrinsic reflectivity, it's just, uh, you know, it's just very difficult to have enough signal, enough brightness of those probes to give us a type of signal after light passing through the skull. But you know, the, the method we develop can potentially be used, for example, during surgical operation. If you really want to look at whether this brain region is the one with the problem, people could you know, probably introduce dyes and with an open skull, it could be useful. But for now, we are really, at least my personal uh, interest, is really try to just understand the brain for which uh, animal models uh, works quite well. Even though we do fundamental research, but uh, as uh, is uh, typical, what we discover can be easily translated to, to, uh, to um, disease-related research. For example, you know, many neurodegenerative diseases actually have uh, symptoms in the visual system. And without really understanding what's going on there, how the neurons uh, uh, behave normally or in a pathological state, it's really hard to come up with treatment. But, uh, but with that said, my group is not a conventional neurobiology group that focuses on visual research, vision research. Uh, instead, we, and the, the two photon fluorescence microscopy I do is not uh, the typical one that you can just buy from a company. So what I add to this effort that's also, you know, what my group is focusing on is to develop new methods that would allow us to image deeper in the brain and also at a higher uh, speed as well as uh, even uh, in certain cases uh, go to a super resolution in vivo.